I think walking the walk makes a difference. I think living in a place where nobody's willing to live, I think having personal relationships with people that other people aren't willing to have relationships with, I think finding a commonality with somebody on a personal level, those are the things that make peace. You're listening to Seamside, where we explore the inner work of textiles. I'm your host, Zach Foster, and today we sit down one year later with our good friend, Coulter Fussell. But before we hop into that conversation with Coulter, just a few items of business. Number one, a special thank you to all the good folks over at the Quilty Nook. Without your support, projects like Seamside just wouldn't be possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. There's a real sweet review hanging out on Apple Podcasts right now that I wanted to share with you too. It's from Rocco and a bunch of numbers. Rocco says, highly recommend. Zach has a velvety, calming voice. And it feels like a friend who guides me along my quilting and life journey. His podcast makes me think about quilting, fabrics, and even life in a different way. Each week, I look forward to the new episode, and it's a companion for me as I work on a current project. I highly recommend this podcast to anyone who wants to broaden their creative process. Rocco, those are some sweet words. Thank you so much for taking time to write that kind five-star review. If you're like Rocco and you're looking forward to every Thursday these new episodes dropping, one tiny little thing you could do for me that would truly mean so much is to write your own five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really is the best way for other folks to find the magic that's happening right here on Seamside. You've heard me talk the last few episodes about this new ebook I put together. Ebook is a fancy word for PDF, but let me tell you, it's full of some good ideas. That ebook is called 10 Things I Wish I Knew Before I Started Quilting. And I've shared some other highlights with you from that particular publication. But let's look at tips number five and six, because I like them. Number five says you can't mess it up. I truly believe that. Number six, you're going to make some crap quilts. <laughs> Seems like that's kind of contradictory, doesn't it? But both are true at the same time. And if you've made a few quilts, you know what I'm talking about, I bet. Get your free copy of 10 Things at the link in the show notes, and you'll be downloading and reading these 10 reflections in no time. Hopefully save you a little time, trouble, and heartache. One thing I'm doing differently with this episode, and I just want to give you a heads up, is I've gotten kind of tech savvy, y'all. I figured out how to embed chapters into this podcast. What does that mean for you? Couple of things. Number one, you're able to jump around to different parts. If you want to re-listen to a part, it's real easy to go back if you look at the chapters on your screen. Secondly, though, and especially good for us as visual artists, is I'm putting images of work as we talk about it so that as you're hearing us share work, you can see it if you look down at your phone. It takes a little bit of work, but I really don't mind. So try it out this episode. Let me know what you think. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Now, on with today's show. It's been a year since Coulter and I first chatted here on Seamside. And in that conversation, we talked about the South and family history, the role of community in her work, how she maintains hope in the face of turmoil and conflict. You can find that first conversation, How to Work with What You've Got, in your feed down below under March 2023. In today's conversation, though, Coulter and I reconnect and we explore the traditional magic of making dolls, why in the world she's making quilty headboards, and why Coulter thinks the world's first sculptures were made by very busy mothers. I hope you enjoy this backstitch episode with my friend and yours, Coulter Fussell. Coulter, welcome back to Seamside. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, it's good to see you too, Zach. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, absolutely. How's life down in Water Valley this morning? Well, it's actually kind of cool and nobody likes it. It's been cold for the past couple of days and so there's been a lot of complaining. But I think it's nice to warm up to the 80s today and everyone will be back in their natural temperature. So... Back in the good mood. I like that. I like that. Yeah, it is spring up and down, up and down mm -hmm. for sure. So it's hard to believe, Coulter, but it's been a year since you and I last talked. I mean, truth be told, it might be a little bit over a year, but who's counting? And so 
there's a lot to catch up on. I know you currently have a show in Atlanta right now. You got another one starting next week. And you got some things even further down the pike. So I guess let's start with Atlanta. What's already up? What's going on in your world there? Yeah, I've got a show at the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center. And um, it has been up since January. And it's only up for another month. But y'all should go see it if you're near there. But it's called Pillow Talk. And it's a bunch of upholstered, these conceptual headboards that are sort of like screens into sort of a nighttime dream world. And um, they're real sort of like, they're playful and um, sort of absurdist in a lot of ways and having to do with like desires and escapes and, you know, all sorts of nighttime things. I love the sound of that. I'm also sitting here in my bedroom at the time of this recording. And I'm looking at my own headboard, which now looks suddenly barren. It's just a hunk of solid wood. It needs something else, right? Can you describe one of the pieces that you especially like in that collection? Yeah, so what I was sort of thinking was, you know, I'm always sort of like trying to think about how do we get what a quilt is in its sort of like essence. And I think it's different for all of us. And how do we translate that to the wall in this sort of traditional art way so I was you know and a lot of that has to do with the plane changing you're going from like flat to up vertical you know and so I was like how do we get from what happens on the quilt when it's flat to up vertical in relation to the bed and then I was like well there's the headboard right there at your head and then what's in your head all your dreams and desires and all the things that you think about when you're lying down at night or whatever And so a lot of these works have like allusions to like sort of dream imagery. They'll have a lot of stuff having to do with desire and love. Uh, A lot of stuff having to do with nightmares. Like there's hurricanes, there's tornadoes, there's like velvet hearts. There's a lot of like sort of saccharine, silly stuff. There's one that's got like a big liquor and wine sign on it. You know, so you're thinking about good times. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. I sort of picture these headboards as like a a sort of a screen into the night because, you know, you think about the times that we are actually under the quilts is at night, really, you know, so that sort of whole nighttime world. It's a real nocturnal show. The pieces don't look that way. They're all really bright. They're neon. They're chiffon, which is very typical of my work. Velvet sequins, all that sort of stuff. And uh, there's a lot of upholstery going on. So they're real, they're like relief sculptures for the wall. I use cut and sew dolls. I use pillows that I've made. Lots of blankets with animals on them. And yeah, it's a real Alice or Alice in Wonderland down the rabbit hole type stuff. And they're about the size of headboards. Some are smaller. Like you could probably use them as a headboard if you were real careful and didn't mind being entirely uncomfortable. But um, you know, <laughs> other than that, they're they're sort of conceptually headboards. You know. Well, that was one question I had for you, Coulter. Is have you scooted a mattress up to one? Have you built that context for a headboard just to see? No, no. You know, they're all built onto panel and the panels wrapped in like felt, wool, whatever. So they're all actually sewn onto layers of fabric. And then the that fabric is stapled around back. So it's upholstered. So they are true upholstered pieces on board. Yeah. So, I mean, you can be easily to make a, to make one on an actual headboard and put the hardware on there and have it, you know, but probably wouldn't be very comfortable. (laughs) Nothing's ever (laughs) quite even on them, you know. So one thing that they do is, you know, I I use these cut and sew dolls. I love quick crafts. I love the idea of crafts, craft kits catered to people who either don't have time to learn the craft, don't have it in them to learn the craft, but still have this desire or this pressure to make a craft. So I love those quick craft things like cut and sew dolls. I took a lot of those, opened them up so you see both sides of the pillow and used them to make these headboards symmetrical, but it comes off really kind of weird. And so I was, I was messing around with like how to make symmetry be sort of the subversive aspect of the piece, you know, as, as opposed to something that 
symmetry being something you would rely on for some sort of grounding or comfort, how to make symmetry be what's weird. You know, a lot of, I was thinking about like the back page of Mad Magazine. I grew up reading a lot of comics. I mean, that's how I learned to really love humor and art and satire and absurdist stuff. It's like, so, you know, the back page of Mad Magazine, the symmetry, you folded it in, it made a whole new picture and it was really weird. It was bizarre. <laughs> you know, when you picked up Mad Magazine, the very first thing you did was go to the back page and I would try, you know, I think all kids did this would try to guess what the image was going to be before you folded it, you know. So these pieces have, you know, sort of that in the back of my mind. And I love that. So, and I hope Amanda doesn't mind me spilling the beans, but Amanda Nadig and I got in a conversation at the most recent Nook Huddle about wouldn't it be fun to make one of those Mad Magazine style quilts? So like an actual quilt that you could wrap up in that you would fold accordion style like yeah, the I Mad saw- Magazine. There was one at a show, at the show we were in, Zach, the one in uh, Nashville. One of those. Yeah, episodes. Elephant Gallery. Quilty Pleasures, I think, was the name of the yeah. show. Yeah, at Elephant Gallery. Mm-hmm. One of those was a folding Mad Magazine quilt. Well, it just goes to show there ain't nothing new under the sun. Somebody's thought of everything. <laughs> but I'm looking here at one of your pieces that I assume is an example of what you're talking about with. Let's see, your outside cat, Janet, which mm-hmm. is b- bizarrely symmetrical. Mm-hmm. Would you? Is that an example of what you're talking uh, about? Yes. Is that the one with the cat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I really like the shape of that pillow with the big curly tail. And, you know, the and cat. The, and it's been decapitated. Yeah, it's sort of like a Cheshire cat. Yeah. Uh, it's in pieces. The head yeah. is pulled and misplaced somewhere else. And I gave that piece a dust ruffle. <laughs> Not just a dust ruffle, but a gold lamig dust ruffle. Oh, yeah. That whole show might have been so in that pleat. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen that fork technique that you can use to make ruffles like that? Yeah, I have. I saw it on Instagram. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Now, this seems like a good moment to point out that I'm trying something new, Coulter, which is... I'm getting kind of tech savvy. I'm getting kind of smart about this. And I figured out a way to show images with the podcast while we're talking about it. So this might be a good time for folks to look down their phone and they can see this cat quilt, if I've done my job, along with some other things as we talk. How's that sound? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay, so you got these headboards, these dreamy, nightmarish headboards. You're playing with asymmetry. You're playing with ruffles and upholstery. And you're having a good time. But the show that you have coming up next week in Mississippi is is none of this, correct? It's something different? Yeah, well, it's still got upholstery. But yeah, so this next show coming up is really about sort of, it's really light studies about like the natural world or whatever. This is the theme that recurs throughout my work across all my shows or, you know, series. But this one is, it's sort of an underlying theme in mind is like uh, just the natural world I live out in a very rural place Um, I'm always we're always real connected to the outside out here so anyway this this is a series of 24 pieces that are sort of upholstered and sewn to panel so they they look and hang like a painting would you know there are various sizes from nine inches square up to like 65 inches square and each piece documents one hour of a day and so it goes from 12 a.m in the morning to 12 a.m the next morning you know or 1 a.m in the morning to 12 a.m the next morning and I just made them an hour at a time I started at 5 a.m I didn't start at 5 a.m in the morning I started with the 5 a.m piece which is when I get up at five and so I started with the 5 a.m piece and then made the 6 a.m piece and made the 7 a.m piece and and just went around And I was about a third of the way through when I realized that a lot of the time I'm asleep. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Right. Uh I mean, can you believe it? I I thought of this show five months ago. It took me this long to be like, oh, wait, I'm not awake for 20. What what am I going to do for 2 a.m.? You know? Uh um, Uh Anyway, that's when I was like, thank God I've made that dream show. Because now I can really carry over this whole nocturnal thing into these nature studies. 
and you know i have a couple of plants that bloom at night and night bloom in cirrus i'm a big like plant person i got a bunch of those and so anyway i had um i got to think about the nighttime pieces as you know compute uh phone screens um porch lights shining through windows headlights street lights you know they're once I started to pay attention, especially out here in the country where it's very dark, in the city, for it's probably different for city people. But once I started to pay attention to the light at night, it just became very, very vivid. And so I got to then incorporate like dream colors, you know, real vivid neons and all this sort of stuff. So anyway, there's a piece for every hour of the day. And so you, as you go through the show, you can see the sunrise you can see it start to get like bright and glary at noon and one or two. You can see the golden hour, happy hour start at, you know, sort of yellows and saturated. And then you can see twilight come on and then it gets dark and velvety. And then you see porch lights come on and you see sort of like this fantastical, dark, lush, rich sort of dream world start to develop. And then it's dawn again. So, and, and the pieces will be arranged just sort of around the gallery in the order. Midnight was like the biggest, the biggest piece. It's the largest piece. It's got like the most velvet in it. That, that was the most fun for me to make. It's really large. It's 60, 65 inches. That orange and black floral on the left of it is actually velvet and it's upholstered. So it's got you can't see it because of the photographs, but it's upholstered. It's got like buttons in it and it's, there's volume there. Is that what upholstered means? You know, how you would upholster like a piece of furniture. Yeah. yeah. It's got foam in it and I've wrapped it in fabric and then I've put buttons and trims and all sorts of stuff in there. <laughs> so. To me, the true dreaminess comes in though, in that bottom left-hand corner with, it looks like this horse print it's kind of like rainbow yeah. iridescent horse print it's like horses or unicorns that's you know all this is fabric from i share all these fabrics they all are in other shows i've got a whole other piece in my headboard series with that unicorn print in it. i love that and that creates a whole other through line right through that goes through collections which i think can be really interesting to think about yeah yeah yeah, you know, my River Raft quit, uh, series has a lot of sort of natural world references to it just because you're on a river. So this sort of plays into that that series as well. Is this show installed yet? It gets installed this weekend. Okay, because I would love to see at some point, I'm sure you'll share, what all these look like together. Yeah, and they're all going to be framed in in these wooden frames, um, these real minimal wooden frames, but <clears throat> the nighttime frames, the nighttime pieces are going to be framed in walnut, so like a dark wood. And then the, the dawn and evening, when things are sort of either pink or, you know, a different pink in the evening, those are in cedar, this sort of pink red cedar. And then in the middle of the day where things are like sort of white and light, this sort of light green, they're framed in poplar. So the wood sort of, the different times of day, sort of matches the, the light of the works. <laughs> and Coulter, I love that so much because I, I think for so many folks, framing can be a little bit of an afterthought or it's a thing that kind of like somehow standardizes all the pieces or brings them together. And you're being so thoughtful about it. You're bringing up just one more layer, one more nuance to this kind of alternative clock that you've built. Yeah, well, I mean, I have to. My natural inclination is to not frame any of it. It it messes up, in my mind, the color transition to the wall, the white wall. But I do know that people can sometimes have a hard time thinking about textiles as art on the wall. And I think that it helps people sometimes to have a frame. I know this because my husband is a gallery director. <laughs> Very helpful. <laughs> yeah, and I think that sometimes people can envision textiles on the wall if you put them in a frame like a painting. But I can't just have the frame. I don't want the frame to take away from the piece. It's got to add to the piece if I'm going to do it. And also, I kind of just like the challenge of figuring out how to frame 24 works that have a that look real different in terms of color. And so I just decided on three different woods. <laughs> one wood wasn't going to do it for me. 
because it would mess up the color, you know, transition to the wall. The edges wouldn't be as like striking as I wanted them to be. Yeah, what you, what you say about frames reminds me of something that Heidi said when she was setting up her studio at the Fister Hotel because you know she's doing this year long yeah. residency. And she very intentionally, one, she wanted a place to sit down comfortably. Like when people came by, they could sit on this little couch, you know, so she got this couch. But then two, she says it serves double duty because she's hung this quilt right over a couch as this kind of subtle modeling of this is what a textile can look like on the Mm -hmm. wall of your home above your couch, right? And I think that's a really savvy maneuver, similar to you and your frames. Mm -hmm. Now, are, are you building these frames yourself? I know you're handy like that. Yeah, I, I'm my father in law is building them. He has a wood shop. He's got an equipped wood shop, and um, I keep saying like, I want a wood shop, you know. And they're and my father in law is like, I'll just do it. I got a wood shop. <laughs> <laughs> Receive the support. Receive the support. You're busy doing a lot of things. Exactly. And so you know, and I always am like, here, let me come help. Let's, you know, I'll, I'll help you. And he's like, just stay home. <laughs> <laughs> you know those slide carpenter they know what they're doing you know, i'd probably be what much more in the way and it's probably easier without me so can i read a quote from a recent review that you shared on instagram and get your take on it ask you some questions mm-hmm. so back in august you had a show called down river and someone for Burnaway wrote a review and you quoted this line which i thought was just so To me, it seemed to really capture so much of what you do. And I'd love to poke around those edges just a little bit with you. So the review and the line that you shared was, but rising from the remains is evidence of where the region and the nation have been. Using what is already here reminds us of how we should hope to move forward. Though the artist doesn't seem to make declarations or even announce an opinion on the future of America. Her habits favor community, gifting, the comfort of our clothes, blankets, and stored ephemera. Yeah, I'm not real heavy handed. And when it comes to my artwork, in terms of like putting out some real clear political view, and it's not because I'm not a political thinking person or whatever, I just go further. (laughs) You know, I think it's all bigger. And I think it's all, uh, I don't want to stop short. I want to keep going. I think that these things that happen to us are real universal and I think they're infinite. And so, yeah. And also I'm a nice, I don't, I don't want to fight, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. It's not about so, that. Well, I've had enough of that in time periods in my life, but I don't want anymore. I don't want to argue back and forth with anybody. I don't think I probably would with a lot of my Instagram followers or whatever anyway, but it's not interesting to me always in in terms of how it relates to my artwork. It's very interesting to me in terms of how I talk, you know, with people I know on a personal one-on-one level or whatever, but my artwork's sort of a different realm in a, a different universe, really. And so I think it, especially with textiles, You can just really address a whole lot of things all at once because, I mean, textiles just alone is so universal. We all wear clothes. (laughs) I mean, right there, you know, and it's the closest thing to our bodies. And we have a real intimate relationship with clothes and fabrics, blankets, all that sort of stuff. And so you can use textiles and immediately you've connected to another human being, no matter what your circumstances Have you ever had any pushback, though, about not taking a stronger stance when things are happening politically? And I wouldn't care if I did. Uh I wouldn't care because I don't believe that stances necessarily publicly, like in, in this big way they do it, people do it on social media, make a difference. I think walking the walk makes a difference. I think living in a place where nobody's willing to live, I think having personal relationships with people that other people aren't willing to have personal relationships with, I think finding a commonality with somebody on a personal level that you otherwise probably would be separated from, those are the things that make peace. And and like I said before, I just do not (laughs) entertain much uh, fighting you know, or bickering. So I'm one of those people who I I won't participate in that. 
and it's a lot of you know some of it's just for personal reasons you know just like protecting myself and it doesn't mean that I'm apathetic or that I'm not doing something that others aren't seeing it's a personal choice of approaching things and it's one that resonates really deeply with me I I think like you I think so much about what's happening in the world around and I'm so tempted and Lord knows I have made pieces in the past that were through the political lens. Mm -hmm. But that was also, for me at least, it became very exhausting in the sense that it felt very narrow, like I was kind of preaching to the choir or, or talking to people who already agree with me. Yeah. And it feels so much more, it feels like it's just a much richer terrain to reach beyond politics. So not to exclude it, but to include it with the totality of human experience and talk about it as, one of the facets of many with what's going on in our world. Yeah, I don't feel that politics immediately means you got to be putting somebody else down or making them feel stupid. I think, and I mean, let's be real. I think that a lot of that is happening mm -hmm. on either side. I mean, there's more than two sides in my view. <laughs> really, it's all just one big crazy side. But <laughs> I think that uh, there's different ways to be political. And um, for me, it's just, pers you know, it's, it's more effective to just have personal one-on-one -on -one conversations or relationships. And not even like intentionally, like we're going to sit down and talk about politics. I think just often just being friends with somebody who's not like you, you know? Mm. So anyway, and also the main thing is like, I think that there are other artists who are better at that stuff than I am. I don't think that that's my strength. And I don't want to make my weakest art. I want to make my strongest art. And so I, I play to what I know I can develop further and that's good and I'm good at. And where I feel is making the difference of connection. That's right. Yeah, because there's, there's a sense about politics like that we have forgotten that the root of politics is polis, right? The, the collective body of the people. Mm -hmm. Like we are truly in this together because we want to see it succeed and we want to have we want to have what we need to have to make this whole thing work right yeah we just have different ideas of how to do that but that's a detail the big picture and the big the broad strokes is we're all a community and we're all in this together and we're talking about this together and we can figure this out yeah i just think that you know often people have changes of heart when their heart has been affected by another person. I think you have to really connect with somebody on a personal level for, you know, any sort of like change to be made or whatever. But that's just how I do it. Everybody's different. And I don't actively do, <laughs> I'm not like, today I'm going to change some hearts and minds. <laughs> it's on your agenda. Yeah, a lot of the hearts and minds are doing just <laughs> fine. Like, who am I to be like, you should be like me. You know, that seems kind of bossy and there controlling. You go presumptuous but um so anyway you know i'm just a person in the world who i feel like the way i do express things best is the way i'm i'm doing it and that's a beautiful model that's a beautiful model all right let's let's put a little upholstery button mm -hmm. in that one and <laughs> i also want to talk to you because i have recently discovered and you have recently rediscovered the the, the magic of doll making and I was so surprised at the affection that I felt for this particular form. But I would love to hear you talk about the the role doll making plays in your creative practice. Yeah. So my grandmother was a great seamstress. Uh, while my mom was and still is an incredible quilter, my grandmother was a great seamstress, sewed great dresses. And a lot of that manifested over into being a really great doll maker. And so she grew or I grew up with her making me lots of rabbit dolls she would make elves she made chickens I mean all sorts of stuff so I really loved animal dolls ever since I was little I like the sort of animal human hybrid that dolls are and I also like how freaking hard they are to make <laughs> <laughs> when a lot of my work is so sort of like loose and free form in a lot of ways in terms of my conceptualizing it a doll I really have to work. It's highly, you know, it's real patterned. I got to, mm. I got to follow the pattern. And if I go off pattern, I 
you know, I've really got to think about it hard to make it work out right. I've been making dolls for, I don't know, on and off, I guess, 10 years. And uh, I sort of use dolls as like a palate cleanser uh, between sort of big shows of like weird, crazy stuff. <laughs> and what is it? What does it cleanse the palate of? And what what does it provide for the palate that how do I want to phrase that question? I don't know. I know what you're asking, though, and it's a good question. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll let you run with it then. Go. <laughs> yeah, it, it, making these dolls sort of gets out any leftover, like, okay, so say I make a big, wild, crazy show. Making the dolls gets out any leftover extra energy and jitter, not jitters, because that sounds nervous, but sort of extra energy from that show that didn't make it into the show, but needs to be expelled before I can start a new series. I've got to clear my mind of what just happened and then start a whole new series. And so between that, I will make highly patterned, got to follow the instructions, dolls. And then, you know, lately I've been using dolls like the the sort of that stuff in using like stuff in and foam and all that. That type of sewing is actually going into the sculptural pieces at Mm -hmm. times. Yeah, it can't help but come back and feedback into other pieces as, as well, I imagine. Mm-hmm. And then of course, like, you know, I was telling you earlier, the dolls, I can, you know, they help me pay some bills. Not mm. only do I really, really love making dolls, but I can also sell them and that will help me pay rent, <laughs> you know. And the these patterns, like we've, I've seen the rabbit ones online and you mentioned raccoons. Are these patterns that you've drafted or someone's drafted for you or how does that work? Well, the rabbit pattern was an old 1980s Cranston pattern. Mm-hmm. The raccoon pattern is a 19, I think it's a 1980s pattern. Yeah, it would be 1980s. But it's from the cartoon, The Shirt Tales, Ricky Raccoon. Do you, do you remember The Shirt Tales cartoon? I don't know. I'm sure people will. And um, they had it was like this zoo in this city. It was a cartoon that came on Saturday mornings. And I loved The Shirt Tales. They had uh, Pam the Panda. And then they had Ricky Raccoon. And so this is a Ricky Raccoon pattern that's been, mo- I modify these patterns to mm-hmm. sort of work how I want them to work. So I basically take, uh, just old patterns that have somehow wound up in my studio, and I use those as my um, the basis of my doll patterns. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is a lot of how dolls have always been made, I imagine, right? Like you receive a pattern from someone passed down to you from your mother, your grandmother, neighbor, and then you're like, oh, but I have this idea. Let me make the torso longer, the arm shorter, or whatever, you know. And then you get to design clothes for them a lot of times. You know, there's all sorts of ways to personalize it. Yeah. Or you receive the doll and then, you know, Mm -hmm. I've done that a few times, found a doll I liked and just take it apart and then make the pattern from that. Well, that's kind of what happened with me recently when I got, I caught the doll fever Mm -hmm. and I was at this thrift store, antique shop, and there was this little hand-sized doll, faceless with a bonnet and a dress. Someone later told me it was like an Amish style baby doll. Mm-hmm. Hand sewn, $2. And I was mm-hmm. just like, oh my. I like, I just couldn't leave it there in good conscience. You know, like there's some people out there who like just have to like adopt every stray dog walking down the street or like any neighborhood cat is now their cat because they need to give it a home. I feel that way about hand sewn objects. <laughs> I'm just like $2. So it came home with me and I like highly embroidered it with a bunch of just purple. It's just all purple, yeah. monochromatic. And it was just so magic to me. And what opened my eyes in that moment is that where quilts can be kind of disembodied and abstract Mm -hmm. from ourselves, from the viewer, dolls are little mini-me's, right? Like they they instantly connect with some part of ourself. It reminds me of like those medical school models of the human brain when when they're talking about like speech, a certain part of the brain lights up or when they're talking about uh, hunger or emotions, different parts of the brain light up. And I feel like dolls can be used almost like that to like direct shortcut into certain parts of the human experience. And we can put ourselves and our own experience in a certain kind of a context. Yeah, dolls really are mirrors, you know, and yeah. then you especially when you anthropomorphize them like when you have half human half animal dolls you can really put human qualities on these animals in this sort of like way that 
you know, it was very, very reflective. Yeah, I love dolls. I think they're great. I, I especially like animal dolls. That's sort of, but you know, that probably just stems back to me just kind of liking animals in general. <laughs> oh. hey, go, yeah, that, that's, listen, it's a very flexible category, very flexible <laughs> art form. Yeah. Okay, so just between you and me, not really because everybody's listening, but <laughs> when I make a doll culture and they're like, it's done, like I look at it, I'm like, yes, you are fully alive now. Mm-hmm. I have this irrepressible urge to take it to bed with me and to like spend the night with it, <laughs> to, like to sleep with it, like under my pillow or whatever. And yeah. it just, it feels just so natural and just so lovely. Like it's, it just feels like this is the most rational next step. Yeah. Is that something you experience or is that just me? Well, I mean, all of my dolls are so cute and I love having them around or whatever. Um, but, you know, my I have two teenage sons, two boys, and they are exactly what you think teenage boys would be. And they get all my prototypes. So they have, every time I've ever made a doll over the history of their lives or a series of dolls, they get the first try, which is the one where I'm making adjustments, the one where I'm using crappy material because I'm just trying to get the pattern sewn right or whatever. So they have all these really bad (laughs) handmade dolls I've made them. And um, they put those dolls in the craziest positions. (laughs) Like, you know, they'll go to school one morning and like I'll go in and check to see if their bed's made or pick up dirty clothes, whatever. And the dolls will be on the bed. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, note to self, do not give a 14-year-old boy, you know, two raccoon dolls. So anyway. And that's what happens to the dolls in my house when they get put on a bed. Well, they beg for interaction, don't they? Oh, yeah. (laughs) So, but no, I I love the dolls. I love how dolls make people feel. Yeah, I'm thinking of, and this is all very new to me. You know, you have much more experience here. But I'm thinking that it might make an interesting practice to make a doll that corresponds to each quilt. So Mm -hmm. that, like with this newest body of work, for example, called um, The New Apocalypse, where I'm (laughs) re-envisioning a plausible positive future for all 8 billion of us, it'd be interesting to make a quilt and then with the scraps left over from those same fabrics, make a doll. And then with the doll, because you know me in text, incorporate some text that really takes the heart of the quilt and personalizes it somehow to really connect with the viewer that way. And then maybe display them side by side or who knows what, who knows what'll happen. But it feels like a very powerful and potent relationship the doll and the quilt yeah i have some works where the doll sort of morphs out of the quilt Mm. sorry if you can hear the tornado siren it's just a test it's in the background okay just okay as long as it's a test yeah (laughs) we're testing the tornado sirens today anyway so you'll have like the piece and then you know the top half of a doll sort of coming out of it so it's like half doll half wall piece or whatever which is beautiful And of course, like it brings those two disparate elements together, but then it also kind of, in a way, it takes the doll out of, I'm going to call it playable commission (laughs) because I think of just last week, like my downstairs neighbor came up, the one that always hears me stomping around the apartment, making quilts and such. And she came up with her daughter and we just had like a nice little pal around time hanging out. And I was like, oh, let me show you her daughter's three years old, four years old, maybe. I was like, let me show you what I've been working on lately. And so I brought out some of the dolls. And she was fascinated with those dolls. Like, I feel like her mom and I could have sat and talked for like hours and she'd have been down on the floor, you know, doing the things that kids do with dolls, you know, making them talk to one another, making them dance, making them move. And it was so fascinating to me to sit back as someone who's made these as art objects first, but also like with deeply personal ties Mm -hmm. to see them in the hands of a child being brought to life and manipulated and like have this whole like reality being reenacted through these dolls, through the mind of a child, like all of that, which is really fascinating to me. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm no anthropologist or archeologist or whatever, but like, it'd be hard convincing me otherwise that the first sculptures made in the history of humanity weren't small sculptures made by women to occupy their children. (laughs) I think that our first sculptures were dolls And I think that they were made, they could either have been sewn or made with dirt, you know, mud, whatever, Mm -hmm. to be small animals or humans and given to their kids to occupy them while they did their own work or whatever. Because that's what happens now. (laughs) Yeah. The first thing we get our kids is a bunch of little dolls, you know. 
so anyway, and um, yeah, I, you know, sometimes I'll look at these old, you know, ancient sculptures and I'm like, that was a doll. That, some- that is not a goddess. That is a doll. <laughs> that, is- that was some two-year-old's little play toy. <laughs> oh, the doll hypothesis by Coulter Fussell. You heard it here first. I love that hypothesis and I'm here for it. Now, if anybody was around, you know, a few hundred million years ago and can disprove the doll hypothesis, we're here for it. Send me an email. Let me know. But uh, I think, Coulter, you're probably on to something. I'm sure somebody knows. Some smart person out there is like, that's not true. But I'm ch- I choose to believe it. <laughs> I like the narrative is all I'm saying. Yeah. I like that narrative quite a bit. <laughs> well, Coulter, I know you and I could talk all day, but you got tornado warnings to attend to. You got computer work. You might want to go do some sewing. So let me let you go. But thank you so much for coming back to Seamside and giving us a update on what you've been working on and what you've been thinking about. Well, yeah. And thank you to Zach for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you again. I really appreciate it. And one of these days, I know we say this every time, but one of these days, I want us to hang out in real life. We need to make yeah. that happen. That's right. That's right. I know I'm going to be ruminating on Coulter's doll hypothesis for a while now. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. One of the things I love about these Backstitch episodes is it gives us a chance to touch base with an old friend and hear what they've been up to for the last year. Because creative practices change, don't they? Ideas evolve. Life happens. And we hear that in these conversations that take place one year later. I hope you've gotten something good out of this talk. And I'll be back next week with another one. Until then, I hope you're well. I hope you're sewing something good. And I hope to see you soon. Maybe on the nook. Who knows? <laughs>